<clears throat> the views and opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of any major corporation whatsoever. <laughs> well then, Daniel Tiger's nay bunny hood. I'm yes. going for kids characters this week if that wasn't clear to you <laughs> okay uh, it, so that's that's what i'm going for this week <laughs> trying to go for nickname themes let's talk about books you see people always say hey steve you really should keep your pants on when you're driving home to which i say you can't tell me what to do. You ain't my dad. <laughs> People also say, hey, write what you know. And what I know is, is that the government is mind controlling the populace via Starbucks. I heard it on Alex Jones. Yes. So it has to be true. Yes. Well, stop getting her to scream. I'm trying to do the podcast, please. OK, don't get her to scream. OK. Um, what I also know is that I have been a loyal, if occasionally misguided, employee at my local bookstore for almost 17 years. Yes. But I started working there when I was 12, so I'm not old at all. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> Eleanor! Eleanor! Eleanor's. Why are you screaming? Because it's fun? Because you don't know how to talk yet? Yeah? You perfectly said, yeah, you can talk. You just don't want to. That's this what... is not professional, Eleanor. Not yeah. professional at all. Professional at all. We pride ourselves in being so professional. And as such, I really do have my hands on the pulse of the book world, and I am here to rub my knowledge in your face holes with this week's remarkably unremarkable installment of The Notes from the bookstore section of the Pope on film. I started saying it wrong, but I'm just going to go with it. <laughs> and we know you have your choice of literature themed podcasts. So from the bottom of our heart, we say thank you for picking the stupidest literate podcast. <laughs> Now, we have been slowly but surely telling the origin story of Mr. Steve, the beloved bookseller, beloved by all. Yes. But first, let's head to the book floor for a bit of book news. The big to-do at your local bookstore this week seems to be the fact that our volatile political landscape here in the United States of Emperor Trump, our glorious leader, all hail Trump! <laughs> The book world is finally catching up with the political world because there are some nasty books that have just been released. Yeah. First and foremost, uh, uh, noted historian Dinesh D'Souza, okay. whose historically adjacent series of books that gets American history and paints it in an alt-right Pepe the Frog swatch, his books, by the way, are currently number one with our nation's old racist grandfathers. Okay. Dinesh D'Souza has an explosive new book that blows the lid off of the Democratic Party's secret ties to Hydra. Okay. Yeah, apparently the Red Skull had a Feel the Burn bumper sticker. Shocking! <laughs> Shocking! Yeah. Meanwhile, in the Too Little Too Late department... Arizona Republican Senator Jeff Flake has a new book out called, Hey, I'm starting to think this Donald Trump guy may be a bit of a dick. <laughs> wow, Senator Flake, it only took you, what, seven months? Wow. Good for you. He's, he's been making the rounds. What, Maxwell? What? 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 I got no bunny. Oh, you gotta tell Bunny something. Okay, go ahead, Maxwell. What do you have to say to Bunny? Bunny, I, I'm starting to think that <laughs> Donald Trump is a stupid head and he doesn't need to tell anything we don't know. That's right. You know, yeah. That's right. You just scared the crap out of me, Maxwell. Just He, <laughs> he took a political stance. Jesus Christ. I, I, no, it's, it's okay, Maxwell. 
I, I, I am proud. Yeah, he's he's mumbling to himself over there, like a like a like Latka, like Latka from Taxi. Well, it's <laughs> it started off with something that clearly to me sounded like Donald Trump. No, it was Donald Trump. He said that Donald Trump was a stupid head and he doesn't yeah. need to tell us what to do because we can all figure it out ourselves. Yes. That's what I thought I heard, but it was immediately like a dream. It was immediately yeah. escaping me. Yeah. yeah I would also like to take this time to say that Walmart has back-to-school stuff out. Yeah. Target is slowly getting ready for Halloween. And Michael's, you know, the craft store? Yes. They have Halloween stuff out, and they already have Christmas stuff out. They already have Christmas stuff out. Oh, my God. So, in September, when your local bookstore starts rolling out Halloween stuff, maybe lay off the, ugh, Halloween already? Yeah. I can't believe they have the Halloween. Halloween stuff out. I freaking hate that. You know, why did you put it out? Because it sells. Oh, they already have Christmas stuff out? I hate that. That's so stupid. I hate when stores put their holiday stuff out so early. I'm going to buy seven books. You know what? I'm going to make it an even ten. <laughs> That's why it's out. It's out because you will buy it. <laughs> you are the reason why this stuff is out. It's not us. It's you. Mm-hmm. So for those listeners new to notes from the bookstore, we have recently slowly but surely been telling the story, the entirely true fake story, I call it that for legal reasons, obviously, of our hero, let's call him Steve. Now, as our story begins this week, it is now the year 2001. Yes. And you know, a lot of things happened back then. A lot of things happened in 2001. Huh. 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 Let's revisit some of them. In the year 2001, Time Magazine's Sexiest Man of the Year. You know who that was in 2001? Uh, was it George Clooney? No, Rudy Giuliani. <laughs> yeah, he was given way too much credit after 9-11. Yeah. In retrospect, maybe we could have dialed down on the on the credit aspect. Yeah. He's so brave. See, I, 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 you know, I appreciate. Well, he was in charge when something bad happened. So brave. I, I appreciate what he did for nine eleven. Okay, uh, but then I was in New York in two thousand four, and it kind of creeped me out. Yeah, you know, it kind of creep. It was safe, but it was safe. It, it, it had that creepy totalitarian government feel to it. Yeah, it was safe in the same way that you know you're not going to get mugged on Main Street at Disney World. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't know. I've always I not liked Giuliani. Like, again, yeah. appreciate 9-11, but even before the Trump thing, just having been in New York at that time, yeah. he creeps me out. Well, and... He really helped New York during 9-11 because he helped people and he brought the city together and then he killed all the homeless, mm-hmm. which which also brought everyone together. Yeah. And then he uh, kicked out all the pornographers. Uh-huh. Man, I miss that 42nd Street. I know. I was that was there, my 42nd but... Street. It is gone. Yeah. My Times Square, because it kind of spilled into Times Square. Is gone too. Yeah. I'll never be able to see a grindhouse movie in a dirty they, section of here, New York. Here is how how gone Times Square is. When I was in the city in, in 2004, in Times Square, getting kind of hungry at that time, we ate at a Planet Hollywood. God, Planet Hollywood. Yeah. Freaking Planet Hollywood, and they had they had all these uh, uh, displays of famous relics from famous movies. Yeah, that you just assumed were true because <laughs> Sylvester Stallone owned the restaurant. 
And then we had a Planet Hollywood in Phoenix, but they didn't have the best things. And I just used to love that right by the bathrooms, they had D.B. Sweeney's jeans from the film Into the Fire. Really? Like, oh, my God. How did they land this coup? Getting D.B. Sweeney's pants. <laughs> it, it, no, it, it was whatever the whatever that the fire down below. Was that it? It was that D.B. Sweeney movie where he was abducted by aliens. Fire in the sky. Fire in the sky. That's it. Yeah. Wow. D.B. Sweeney's jeans from fire in the sky. <laughs> Take that, Orlando. <laughs> D.B. Sweeney's pants. In the year 2000, Tara Reid still existed. Yes. As a normal, legitimate, non-Sharknado-related actress. Isn't that amazing? Well, right around that time, wasn't she starting to get a lot? Again, wasn't she starting to get a bad name right around then? Like I kind of yes. remember a lot of Tara Reid jokes. I think two thousand. Like, like my my that- my first awareness of Tara Reid, you know, because I wouldn't recognize her from Big Lebowski at that point, is related to how bad Tara Reid is in Tara Reid jokes. I reckon I first uh, came to be aware of Tara Reid. She had an E entertainment television show and it was like a travel show, but it was basically just her excuse to get totally shit face wasted in different places across the globe. Okay. So I think that's what she was doing at this period in time. Hi, we're here in Belize, a great place with culture and people. Now watch me get blacked out drunk. <laughs> is basically what Tara Reid was doing. Yeah. At an award ceremony in 2001, then kooky nut job Angelina Choli made out open mouthed and everything with her own brother. That is a true story. Really? A, yeah, it's worth a Google. Like Ooh. when, uh, like in the Lego Batman movie, when the Joker was listing off all the bad guys. Did you make some of those up? Nope, they're all real. Worth a Google. And he was right. I wasn't aware of the fact that there was an actual uh, Batman villain called the Condiment King. He's, <laughs> he's an actual Batman bad guy. I thought for sure, like, okay, that last villain, they definitely made that up for the Lego Batman movie. Hell no! He is a Batman villain. <laughs> so, yeah, Angelina Jolie made out open mouth, uh, possibly tongue kiss with her own brother at an award ceremony worth a Google. The resulting scandal left her feeling so guilty that since then she has not stopped adopting orphans. <laughs> out of guilt. Out of guilt. I missed that kiss. Yeah. A lot of famous people died in 2001. Two big famous people I'd like to talk about now. Pretty sure I didn't get these mixed up. Legendary R&B singer Dale Earnhardt died right after starring in the title role in the vaguely horror film The Redneck Guy of the Damned. (laughs) While legendary white NASCAR driver Aaliyah died in the final lap of the Daytona 500. So sad. Yeah. So sad. I cried when uh, Aaliyah died at the Daytona 500. So sad. Yeah. In the year 2001, Mattel sold a vibrating Harry Potter broomstick, introducing a whole generation of kids to the magical world of sex toys. Yes. I remember that. I remember that very and, well. The Nimbus 2000. And I, I, I looked up this fact, and it blew me away, and I've been thinking about it all week. In the year 2000, more people visited neopets.com than freaking google neopets neopets.com you adopted a virtual magical pet you took care of it you played games with it you fed it and you gave it money so you could buy it nice things neopets.com more people visited neopets than google and if you don't know what neopets is then you've never felt the frustration of trying to get free things before everyone else on the goddamn money tree. 
Oh, I was so pissed off. There was a tree in the middle of the ne- Neotopia where you could uh, donate things that you didn't want, like a banana or a cookie or a blanket <laughs> or uh, some money. Yeah. And your Neopet would feel better about itself because there were different levels of happiness and hunger and yada, yada, yada. And so there was a money tree and you had to keep refreshing the website when you were on the money tree because something free will show up and you have to be the first person to click it to claim it. Oh. And so if you wanted money or food for your <laughs> Neopet, you literally had to just refresh a web page over and over again and be the first person to click. And it was a pain in the ass. But if you did it right, you could get some money and some really nice things because people donated a bunch of things to the money tree. But it was a pain in the freaking ass. <laughs> anyway, anyway, uh, I, it, 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 that was a large portion of my 2001 and 2002. Yes. Uh, but anyway, in 2001, our hero... Let's call him Steve. Uh, if you remember, he was dating Hurricane Debbie. Yes. They loved each other. They hated each other. They fought all the time. Uh, Steve drank like crazy. Debbie did a bunch of drugs. Debbie and Steve rarely got along. Plus, um, uh, my parents kept me uh, sheltered so much that I had no idea how to cook. I had no idea how to clean. I had no idea how to do any laundry or pay bills or any other things that normal people need to know in order to be an adult. Yeah. I was given life, but I wasn't shown how to live. So with that in mind, in 2001, Steve moved in with Debbie. Let's explain why. Uh, my parents never talked to me like I was a normal person. Right. I was always their teeny tiny sensitive fragile son, even when I was 16, 18, 21 years old. So talking about my childhood experiences is difficult because my parents never told me what was happening. My parents never told me their problems. My parents never explained any financial problems. They never told me their feelings. They never told any, me any issues at work or anything like that. It just wasn't done. I am parents, you are a kid. So I never knew about the serious financial problems that plagued our family or or uh, the work problems or, or any fights that my parents had. I never knew anything like that. Meanwhile, I'll happily tell that we're very painfully honest with our kids. Yeah. You know, where it's like, hey, can we go somewhere? No, we can't. We do not have the money. We are broke right now. You need to wait. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's something that, that my parents would never, ever do. Yeah. That just wasn't done. Oh, yeah. it, it, I, I, there's a lot of in retrospect when talking about my childhood. My, my parents had that, too. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of, there's a lot of in retrospect that happens when I'm talking about my childhood. So in retrospect, it's obvious what happened now, but at the time it was confusing and hurtful, but... But at the beginning of 2001, my, my mom came up to my brother and I, and she just looked us straight in the eye. We were, we were sitting on the futon, yeah. in the futon room, watching TV, and my mom just, like, kicked the door open, and she's just, hey, boys, listen up. Your father and I are moving to California at the end of the month, so you have 30 days to find a new place to live because you're not coming with us. <laughs> and she walked out. Yeah. And that was it. We panicked for a little bit. Eventually, when we tried to talk to my my family about it some more, my dad wouldn't talk about it. And my mom would say, well, uh, my dad, uh, your father accepted a, a, a new job in California, in Sacramento. And so I'm moving there with him. And you guys need to find some other place to live because I don't want you to come with us. It's about time that we spend some time by ourselves. It's about time that we have time to ourselves without you kids here all the time. Maxwell, stop jumping on the couch. Okay, Eleanor has not m- mastered the whole walking thing, so you shouldn't be jumping on the couch, okay? Okay? Again, you need to be good for her. She sees everything that we do. Have you noticed that I haven't been smoking crack anymore? Yeah. That's because I don't want Eleanor to do it. So you need to be like that and not jump on the couch, okay? I also don't do crack, just to be clear. I don't do crack. <laughs> Now, meth, that's a fun time. So now, with the eyes of a 40-year-old father of, uh, let's just say, various, 
it's obvious that my parents' endless financial problems caught up with them, and we were just evicted from that home. But it's just like my parents did not tell me that. Yeah. You know? Meanwhile, in the future, Natasha and I are painfully honest with our own children, but, you know, whatever, that's beside the point. So, without a home, our hero was forced to get creative. Our hero went to his girlfriend, Hurricane Debbie, whose parents recently moved to Idaho for no discernible reason. Sometimes you just go, sometimes you just go, I'm moving to Idaho now, and you just, you just skip off to Idaho. But her parents wanted to keep their house in Phoenix in case things went sour. So a handful of the Hurricane sisters stayed in their shitty house in Phoenix. Uh, Four of the six uh, siblings lived there and rent free, too. They just had to pay uh, water utilities. And that's when our hero moved in. Because uh, our hero mm-hmm. was just uh, kicked out of his parents' house and needed a place to stay. He wasn't ready to, to completely start over. His job was good. So that's when our hero moved in with his girlfriend. At this house, they had five dogs, two cats, and a ferret. The house never not smelled like shit. Oh. And it was there that our hero's latent asthma finally kicked in and kicked in for good. Yay! So, our hero moves in with the hurricane. They fought all the time. Plus, Debbie was a bit weirded out by the whole religion thing that um uh that uh, steve had created yeah and he started getting pressed too because this is like 2000 2001 uh every month there would be some wacky morning radio show in fargo or somewhere that wanted to do an interview with steve and uh npr and various vaguely f- famous syndicated radio shows yeah. it was on mark and brian back when that was the thing um, Man Cow's Morning Madness was really rude to me. I was yeah. on Howard Stern for about 45 seconds. Yeah. Maxwell, again, stop getting her to scream. Please stop getting her to scream. Okay? This is, this is fun and exciting. Oh my god, there's a naked woman on the bed. Oh wait, it's just a Barbie doll. Thank god. <laughs> I was worried. I was a bit freaked out. I thought I was in uh, I thought I was in a Porky's movie for a second. I'm coming in with a lovely So, uh, Debbie hated all the press that Steve was getting because uh, as my girlfriend, she fielded a ton of questions. You yeah. know? Yeah. Suddenly she's getting all these questions about my religion and she wasn't prepared. She wasn't, a, you know, a, she 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 didn't like my religion, but right. she didn't she like a lot of. She does it. have that a sainthood, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I did that to try and cheer her up, and it didn't work. But I don't want to change any of the sainthoods just because of something that happened. I just want to yeah. keep them all. But back to work. Our hero was a good little bookseller back then. He got kudos in his first year by being every bookseller on a secret shop. Oh, back, okay. back then the secret shops were easy. Now there's a massively detailed, like five page list of things that a, a secret shopper has to do. But back then they had to come in. They had to see if they were greeted by a bookseller. They had to uh, ask for a book uh, that wasn't in the store and see if we offered to order it. And then we, the, the bookseller had to ask, the cus the secret shopper had to ask for a book that was in the store and the bookseller would have to take them to that section and not just find the book, but put the book in the customer's hand. And uh-huh. then at the register, they had to be offered a membership card and they, it had to be fast cashiering and they had to, and, and that was it. I did all of those right. And apparently my store had never gotten a 100% until I came along and I was the greeter and I was the cashier and I was the only bookseller on the floor. I did everything and I did everything right. And I was very, I got some real big, strong kudos with that. Yeah. Kudos and uh, compliments and like a little certificate, which has all been erased. Nice. Again, because when I went to California, they didn't bother to get any of my records. So. I might as well have just set the building on fire and they wouldn't have known. Yeah. But 
Work Wasn't All Peaches and Lump, both hit songs by the band The Presidents of the United States of America. <laughs> Great band, by the way. I really like Peaches. Arizona is full of old people. Old, okay. crank, racist, old people. People who weren't ready for the Steve. There were numerous incidents that happened. Like one time an old woman came to the store manager and said, I have, I have a complaint. There is a strange man who's sitting in the children's department and he's obviously up to something. He's, he looks weird and he shouldn't be sitting in kids. He's sitting there all alone. He doesn't have children. He's reading these horror movie magazines and someone needs to kick him out because I know he's up to something. And the manager came in, saw me sitting there for my 15 minute break because the kids section had really comfy chairs, yeah. laughed in my face and then uh, explained to the customer that the creepy person is actually the best employee that they have in the store. <laughs> Because it was me. Yeah. I'm the creepy guy. There was another time that one of my friends from grade school was it came it was going to meet me at the store to give me some movie tickets. And I was looking for him and 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 I wasn't sure where he was. So I got on a stool and I'm I'm looking up over the shelves. Yeah. I'm on the stool and I see him on the other side of the store and I go, uh, Alex! Alex and I'm like waving like crazy and pointing at myself. Alex and I'm waving my hand and I'm pointing at myself and I'm waving and I'm pointing at myself. And then 20 minutes later, there's a complaint about me because apparently, you know, the Mexican you have working, yeah. he's throwing gang signs in the store. Oh. Now, the thing that really pisses me off about these incidents is that I was like 22 uh -huh. years old. And I laughed them all off because I thought they were freaking hilarious. Yeah. If these things were to happen to me now, I would not be laughing about them. You know, I yeah. feel that by laughing about them, I brush them off. Mm -hmm. I wish something like that would happen now. Oh, man, I, like, like I, I'd be fighting back, you know? Yeah. But um, working... At the bookstore, introduced me to my my one true love at the time, Bennigan's. Bennigan. See, Debbie and I only had one car, and it was a crappy car. And it would it, it, there was a there was a, a a a cord connected to the battery that would just sometimes come off, and so you would be driving in the freeway, and then suddenly the entire car would shut off. Nice. I've had cars like that before. Yeah. So Debbie would have to pick me up after work. And a, as many booksellers can tell you, back then and still now, if you are in a closing shift at, a book, at, at the bookstore, you are getting off at question mark. Yeah. The doors close at 10. You could be out of there at 10, 20, 10, 30, 10, 45. You could be out of there. I, I, I once got out of there at 11, 30 because the manager was just – so upset with with how horrible the store looked i had a manager named perry who once literally said the store looks horrible and we are going to stay here for as long as it takes i don't care if we are here for an hour two hours we are going to stay here until we get it right also and this is a quote also i am going through a divorce i don't want to be at home and i don't see why you guys should go home and have a good time either oh God. That was an actual quote. That was an actual quote. It's like, wow, you're supposed to like hint at that. You're not supposed to be so blunt about it, you know? Yeah. Jesus. So Debbie would sometimes be late picking me up and I'd have to wait for her. And most of the time I'd just be sitting outside of the bookstore smoking. Uh -huh. But um I realized early on that literally about a five minute walk away there was a bar slash restaurant, so I'd walk there, and then five minutes later, I'm sitting at the bar drinking uh, half price during happy hour. That was Bennigan's. It became my base of operations for the entirety of 2001 and the beginning of 2002. Nice. In fact, it all came together, too. My online presence and my 40 hours of working at the bookstore. And, and so it, it, eventually, at the end of my shift, 
I'd be walking to Bannigan's with a few other employees, you know, right after work, me and like three other people. And we're just walking to Bannigan's and we just close the bookstore. We're walking together and I'd open yeah. the door and there'd just be a big chorus of Reverend. <laughs> nice. They'd already be getting my beer and stuff. It, it, it was a great time for me. If you overlook the bad relationship and the hideous house that smelled like shit and the blackout drinking and the whole fake college life. In fact, right. Debbie and I were such fixtures there that we were soon invited to the inner circle. Oh. Apparently, the two head bartenders at the now very much closed Bennigans. I think there's only like three Bennigans left. Yeah. Maybe like 10 Bennigans left in the entire nation. But back in the day, there were a bunch of them. It was like a Denny's, but uh, classier and with drinking. Yeah. Um, so the two head bartenders at that Bennigan's live just a stone's throw away in a crappy apartment with the head cook at the Bennigan's. And so after they closed for the night, people would go to their place to drink more and smoke pot and listen to Grateful Dead until 4 a.m. Uh -huh. It was a great time. Nay, it was a wonderful time. <laughs> it was my first real introduction to the Grateful Dead. In fact, um, in fact, the first time I heard St. Stephen, I was really working hard on making a name for the for the the Church of Edwood, and I thought for sure the song was about me. Ah, St. Nice. Stephen with a rose in and out of the garden he goes, country garden in the wind and the rain. But then this is the part where it really talked to me. Wherever he goes, the people all complain. <laughs> yeah. So it, I still like the song. I have it on my phone. I listen to it at work. In fact, just to be clear, one of the one of those head bartenders ended up in eventually marrying one of Hurricane Debbie's sisters, and they're still married and living in California, and they have a kid, and I think they have another one all the way. And all thanks to my binge drinking. You're welcome. <laughs> You're welcome, guys. <laughs> that all came from me and my liver, just to be clear. Yeah. So work was good. It was really laid back. The store manager had all of our backs, even through all of the racism that was thrown at me. I can't think of any other store manager who would let us listen to Bill Hicks' Arizona Bay during closing. Yeah. Or uh, Public Enemies' Fear of a Black Planet, Money Python's The Final Cut. Also, this never happened again. I worked at. Th I have worked at three different locations. This never happened again. Free coffee. Nice. Absolutely against the rules. It just went to show you how unprofessional we were there at that first store. Free coffee. Oh, my God. It was wonderful. Did that start coffee. your coffee addiction or were you already addicted? I, I was already in college trying to drink coffee, but I wasn't drinking it. Yeah, I wasn't drinking it because I liked it. I drank it because, look at me, I'm 19 years old and I'm living at a dorm and I'm not really going to class. I should be one of those guys drinking coffee. So yeah. I only drank it at first to be cool. So, yeah, I think the free coffee was what really finally did it for me. Yeah. Yeah. It was a great time back then. Back then, back then, Harry Potter books just came out. Yeah. No party, no staying up until question mark, no massive amount of prep time that doesn't even matter. Because no matter how much time and effort and money you put into a Harry Potter Midnight Magic Party, people will still be pissed and complain on the internet. Yes. It does not matter. <laughs> you could have you could have Daniel Radcliffe there signing everybody's uh, foreheads. And yet people would still be online and saying, I can't believe they didn't have Hermione. And also, I wanted my butt autographed. One star. Yeah. It does not matter how much time you put into it. People will still hate it. Anyway, I'm, 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 I'm sorry. I'm very bitter about this. Okay. Um, it's okay. So our hero you was happy. That out. Was, I know, I know, I know I do. Our hero was happy in Arizona. He had work friends. 
He had his own little cheers. He was doing good at work. Things were great. FYI, little peek in the future here. By the beginning of 2002, Steve would be facing homelessness. All right. So let's not go there yet. Let's still no. let's still bask in the happiness. He, in fact, here is a happy story. Steve's first ever story time happened in Arizona. The kids lead the person in charge of the children's department. Wow! Surprise! Surprise! A middle-aged white woman. Yes. Wow, how surprising is that? You don't expect to see a middle-aged white woman when you go into the children's department of a bookstore. No, you expect to see a long-haired Mexican in a suit and tie. (laughs) A long-haired Mexican male. That's what you expect to see in the children's department of a bookstore. A creepy-looking guy with a huge mustache. (laughs) That, yes, thank you for saying that I'm the creepy guy, Maxwell. And That's Daddy, awesome. I yes? don't think you're creepy. I think you're hinta. Oh, I thank you, Maxwell. You. And you're choking me. Thank you. I love you. I love you too, Maxwell. Uh, um, one say has been Ingy Clay. Oh. Lay. Not sure I weigh. I think yeah. it might be because Woolske is umming K up A, but... Yeah, not one hundred, not one hundred percent yet as to why. Anyway, the kids lead was going to do a story time. We did story time back then once a month. Every time we did story time, we had a costume character show up. We'd get whoever the newest person was to dress up in in, in the outfit that they sent us. And it was a costume story time we did at the end of every month. Well, it turns out this one time the kids' lead was sick. They needed someone to read the story. So before we opened that day, the manager said, hey, the, our kids' lead called in sick. We need someone to read the story. Who wants to read the story? Nobody raised their hand. Come on, guys. Somebody has to read the story. Who wants to read the story? Nobody raised their hand. Okay. If no one wants to read the story for story time, how about this? One of you has to. Who is it going to be? Nobody raised their hand. Finally, the manager's like, okay, I know who I hired. I know everyone that I hired. I hired you all myself. I know some of you are theater nerds. <laughs> or were theater nerds. Raise your hand if you were a theater nerd. And I raised my hand, and then um, the manager said, congratulations, Steve. You're reading story time. <laughs> And it just so happened we were we were having corduroy stories on corduroy the bear, and I had to read corduroy. And I got the book, and I went to the manager, and I said, "What do I do? How do I story time? I, how do I do this?" And the manager said, "It doesn't matter. Just be loud. There's going to be like 45 kids there, so just be as loud as you can. Be fun, and uh, that's it. Bye." <laughs> and so it was my first story time, and I was really like crazy nervous, and I still am. It's been, I've been working at this job for almost 17 years, still crazy nervous every time. And um, the one thing that I heard from everyone was, wow, that was really good. You were a bit loud. Yeah. Wow, thank you for doing story time. That was so great. You were a bit loud. (laughs) And then literally the people in the cafe are like, Jesus, Steve, we heard every word of that book. How loud are you at story time? You should have a quieter story time. And I took that to heart. That's why now if you see my live stream of story time, you can't hear what I'm saying because I whisper throughout the entire thing. Yes. Hi, kids. Welcome to the story time. We're going to read a book. That's story time now. (laughs) So quiet all the time. Yeah, so that was my first story time. So this was the beginning of the end in regards to Arizona. Okay. So, so the hurricane and our hero were basically house-sitting for the hurricane's family. It was a sweet deal. Well, around the end of summer 2001, the mom, uh, her, Hurricane Debbie's mom, was just sick and tired of freaking Idaho, so she moved back. Okay. She moved back home. Suddenly, I'm living with my girlfriend, uh, five of her sisters, and her mom. Uh-huh. She was real nice. 
and she was real nice and she was real supportive of me and junk. Uh, she moved in with us. Uh, but it's hard well, to fuck on the washer anymore. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. And it was only a, a matter of time before the rest of the family came back. I was promised early on that I could stay, but as 2002 rolled around, uh, the hurricane's dad, who had some sort of a, med- a, a, a medical condition that made him physically incapable of smiling or showing emotion. Uh huh. Yeah. Familiar he wanted me the fuck out. Else. Yeah, he just wanted me out. And okay. we will leave the story there. When we when we return next time, it will be Homeless Steve in 2002. Okay. A great our hero. And that is it for notes from the bookstore this week. And remember, kids, you too can save 10% on all of your purchases. And all you have to do is find a GameStop where the employees are not all douchebags. <laughs> all you have to do. All you have to do. You might as well You might as well uh, try and win the Monopoly game at McDonald's. It's about the same. It's about the same skill. The same difficulty. Anyway, good luck with that. And we will see you next time on the Pope on Film Podcast. Notes from the bookstore. Yada, yada, yada. And cut.